Well, good morning, everybody, and happy Monday. This is our first Monday uh, episode of Chronicles Magazine podcast. And of course, I'm your host, CJ Ingle. I'm delighted to be uh, joined today uh, by James Kolb, who uh, wrote an essay recently in Chronicles Magazine. Um, of course, he's a friend of Chronicles Magazine. He's um, written several books that I've read and I recommend, and we'll get to those at the end. But um, the topic of today's discussion is Paul Elmer Moore. So we'll get into who he was, why he's important, and why he was the subject of a Remembering the Right essay. So um, good morning, James, and thank you for joining me. Uh, good morning. It's good to be here. Before we get into the substance of uh, Moore, let's talk about um, your background and maybe, you know, what why did you write on more? Because I know how the Remembering the Right series works. Sometimes we suggest uh, someone we want to write about. Sometimes we're asked to do one. But um, did they ask you to write about more? Is that someone that you've read before? I, somebody I read before, and I suggested it. And uh, yeah, Paul was pleased by the idea. Um, you know, he was like a central figure uh, in uh, in American conservative thought uh, to the extent that uh, that was something you could be a central figure in. Uh, back in the, uh, I don't know, the, uh, up to the 30s. Mm -hmm. And uh, as part of a, a group called the uh, New Humanist uh, that was uh, more or less the, the most prominent figure uh, in which was Irving Babbitt. And uh, except he was personally and intellectually quite different. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting figure from that standpoint. How do you place the humanists? Where did they come from? And um, like, wh where were they centered geographically and all that? Gee, um, they were uh, mostly people from the Midwest who ended up in the East. So it was, uh, I guess, a social uh, background, sort of like the neoconservatives who started off as uh, uh, people from uh, non-central ba non background and ended up in the uh, citadel of intellectual uh, power or influence. And mm -hmm. uh had to decide what they were going to do about that. But of course, the new humanists were quite different. Um, they, uh, there were people who, you know, like classic ideas in lear learning and life. And they also wanted to be realistic about life in America. And uh, for example, how would you, uh, how do you work democracy? Uh, you know, can you have uh, a sort of intellectual aristocracy that lends some guidance, uh, you know, to keep uh, keep things on an even keel, to maintain moderation and continuity, uh, to connect what's happening now to uh, the, the experience of mankind, and, mm -hmm. and so on. And uh, so those are the uh, political issues they're concerned with. And mm -hmm. uh, from an intellectual standpoint, uh, they weren't really traditionalists. Uh, they were interested in... Uh, constructing from uh, observation of experience, mm. a humanistic theory of uh, you know, how we should live our lives, uh, what we should look to, uh, you know, how, how we should uh, remain, uh, retain good sense and continuity in the middle of change and so on. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're interesting from that standpoint. One of the things that we emphasize, you know, at Chronicles is that the old right one of the features of the old right, you know, before World War II, was that it critiqued the managerial revolution. It critiqued the New Deal and stuff. But these people wrote before the New Deal. So he, I mean, Elmer Moore was born in 1864, and he lived until 1937. So the so the 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 core of his writing probably was in the teens and 20s and 30s. So this this was basically before, um, I mean, with some exception, the, the New Deal revolution. Uh, so, but they were critiquing. Uh, the tendencies and trajectories of of the American economy and political life, even back then. So, what was going on back then that would cause them, um, you know, frustration or you know, inspire them to write against some of these trends? Well, pretty much similar trends. There's a, a tendency toward a, a technological approach to life. You're mm -hmm. supposed to be practical. Uh, you weren't supposed to be uh, concerned about. Uh, aesthetic so much as and what, what was useful because uh, you remember before the new deal there was like the new freedom and there's progressivism all of which uh you wanted to use science right to, uh, you know readjust uh uh you know how people live and, and ways of thought and so on and uh 
you know, these people, the new humanists, thought that just left out too much because uh, you know, human beings are not the same as the sort of things you study by modern science. Right. And so therefore, you have to have, to have a different way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned early on he, he spent uh, years in a cabin in Vermont reading uh, Greek and Latin classics. So just absorbing um, basically the great tradition, you know, the things that pre-existed uh, that were not fashionable maybe at the, in the early 20th century. Uh, how do you think that kind of set him on pace for critiquing the American way of life? Well, a lot of it was sort of self-critique. You know, he started off as a sort of rabid romanticist who uh, you know, liked to write uh, romantic poetry. And, uh, and, and then that didn't seem to work. Mm -hmm. And so he started looking for other things, and he became a uh, materialist who wanted to come up with a theory like Democritus, that all there is is uh, atoms in the void. Right. And that didn't seem sufficient. So then he became, in effect, a Hindu. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he had this uh, monistic idea of the great soul that I guess, uh, yeah, Americans can fall prey to. You can find things like that in the transcendentalists. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I think that's what led him to go to uh, Harvard and study Sanskrit, um, mm -hmm. which is where he met uh, uh, Irving Babbitt, who had a much more settled, a much more classicizing attitude toward things. They had long arguments, and Babbitt mostly converted more and convinced more that his education had been lacking because he hadn't studied the classics. Mm -hmm. And so I went up to his cabin in Vermont and read the classics for two years, the classics meaning the Greek and Roman classics. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so uh, with that, he looked at ac the academic life, but decided that was becoming, uh, again, sort of too uh, use-oriented. You know, when he was first at Harvard around 1900, I guess in the uh, 1890s, they were having their anti-classics revolution where they were promoting the sciences and the elective system. And uh, he thought that wasn't going to go anywhere because students weren't going to end up with anything very solid or useful. <laughs> and he thought that uh, the whole vogue for PhDs that started in Germany was uh, ruining the academic life because it made people too specialized. So they couldn't uh, comment on uh, generally useful on, on things that are that actually had some human use. Mm -hmm. So he didn't go for his PhD. Uh, he taught for a couple of years at Harvard and then at Bryn Mawr. And then he set up as a literary critic and made his living that way for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. It's it's funny because to, you know today we, we have similar critiques about education and a lot of people just, I guess, instinctively presume that the you know things started going downhill in education in you know the 60s and 70s and 80s but these are the same critiques that more dealt with um before the the 20th century i mean these were the same trends that were happening back then and he realized that there was something um you know socially and culturally civilizationally damaging in severing uh this modernist empire from the deep past yeah the uh uh yeah, you know, I mean, the more you look at things, the farther back things to go, the things go. And so, uh, again, this very utilitarian engineering approach to things mm -hmm. really was taking off in American life in the uh, uh, second half of uh, the 19th century. Um, and uh, it was really conquering the, uh, the heights like Harvard uh, by the time you got to the 1890s. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it goes way back. Yeah, and, and he recognized that early on, and he and he actually you can kind of see his progression as he writes his like four volume, uh, you know, work on the the you know the great Greek tradition and then the Romans, and he actually you know as you said started off as a materialist, and then he found Plato, and so he admitted the spiritual world, but he kept going and realized that it all culminated for him in this just this acceptance of Christianity that he was sort of forced to accept. Yeah, no, he really thought his way into it and lived mm -hmm. his way into it. Uh, do you think his Do you think his academic work on the historical development of thought was sort of a personal struggle for him? Well, the uh, in other words, yeah, he, as uh, as he studied the development of thought, he he himself followed with the the long that long train. 
Well, yeah, as the uh, uh, sense of trace things to it, to their causes mm-hmm. and traced out their implications, you know, that obviously had a big effect on his outlook on things. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, uh, you know, how do you bring it all together? Uh, you know, as I, I think I suggested, <laughs> this <laughs> about dialectic where you start from manicist then you turn into a materialist then you turn into a hindu then you turn into a platonist because that somehow brings together the material and the spiritual uh, through the theory of the forms and then you decide that well uh it has to let it get a little bit more real than that and which is where uh, christianity and the doctrine of the incarnation is all right. about uh you know his up uh, has like that four or five volume uh you can uh work on the Greek tradition, which is really about the doctrine of the incarnation, mm-hmm. how platonic thought really ended up with the Council of Chalcedon. Right. Uh, which is, <laughs> it's rather interesting. Yeah, he, he tries to uh, uh, you know, boil things down to what the most important points were as he sees them. And it's, it's, it's really fairly interesting. It's worth reading. You know, so in reading the Greeks and absorbing them, he he really held on to Plato in a way that um, in a way that he wouldn't for like someone like Aristotle. And he was he was somewhat critical of um, like the the Catholic Aristotelianism. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He thought it tried to explain too much. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he liked Plato because Plato used myths and Plato was a poet. And uh, and, and also there's this feature in Plato about uh the one and the many, and uh, uh, you know the uh, the confusion of uh, of sensible experience and the ideal forms, and how do you bring that together? And, and both are real, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, that was important to him to uh, to admit that there's a point beyond which you really can't uh, sort things out and come up with some absolute answer. Right. Yeah, you, know, you can get reliable answers that you can count on, but uh, there's always going to be something that escapes us. And, and that, that was a very important principle for him. Mm-hmm. Do you think in his critique of the 20th century or what would be the 20th century, do you think he came across, do you think his uh, contemporaries saw him as like just curmudgeonly? There were different views. Uh, I think H.L. Mencken, uh, you know, complained about him. And one thing he complained about was that he wasn't really polemical. Mm-hmm. And another thing he complained about was the uh, classicism. Uh, but he also said that uh, Moore was really the nearest thing America had to a scholar. Yeah. Because you know, Moore had such broad and deep interests and, and took it all seriously and, and worked his way through it. Mm-hmm. So uh, there was that. Uh yeah, he struggled for influence because the times were against him. Mm-hmm. You know, the 30s came along and, uh, you know, people thought we have all these uh, economic problems and look at what's going on in Europe. And uh, so so why do we need to read Cicero? Right, you exactly. Know? Right. <laughs> it didn't seem. Yeah, and, uh, but he wasn't stationed at, was he stationed at a university at all or was he completely independent? Uh, he was basically independent. Uh, after he, uh, you know, stopped, being the literary critic for the nation, he, he actually moved to uh, Princeton, uh, Princeton, New Jersey, mm-hmm. uh, not because he had a position with Princeton, but because it was a nice place to live and uh, he liked the house that he could buy there. So he, he so he, he basically funded that. himself purely on just his writing. Uh, that, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah writing, lecturing. Uh, he would also get uh, academic gigs, which I guess must have paid a bit more than uh, sure. adjunct uh, professors get these days. Mm-hmm. You know, he'd go out to uh, Berkeley and lecture for uh, a semester or, or whatever. Right. Right. Uh, but yeah, he uh, did support himself uh, pretty well on his writing. Yeah. And lecturing and, uh, uh, you know, sort of sporadic uh, positions, uh, doing something or another at, at universities. At, at Princeton, for example, they uh, eventually realized, well, we, got, we have this guy here who can have him teach all sorts of graduate seminars. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you, you know, it was uh, informal enough at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, so they could engage him to do that. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the students would come over to his house and talk to them about, I don't know, Plato or the Hellenistic philosophies or whatever. Right. And, uh, 
you know, so so that that would have brought in some money as well. He would not have been a, a a friend of of mass democracy. He didn't put a lot of faith in the ability of the masses to guide society in the right direction. No, th well, that's right. I, I mean, he thought that we needed some sort of a accepted intellectual aristocracy, uh, and uh, he thought if things were working right, you'd have people like Washington. Uh, or uh, he also thought highly of Lincoln mm -hmm. as uh, yeah, a man of vision and moderation. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, had a pretty good idea of what the, the you know what the political situation demanded. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, was able to calm passions and uh, sort of raise enthusiasm when he had to. So uh, he had some hope that you could have a uh, a democracy or a system that uh, was based on voting mm -hmm. that would also, uh, you know, recognize uh, people who had merit as leaders. Right. And there are some examples he could point to. So he, he's, he wouldn't have been like a, a modern egalitarian type where everybody has, you know, everyone's voice is, is equal. You know, he, he did see an intellectual aristocracy as needing to guide the people. Well, yeah, yeah, or that, uh, you know, the people have to recognize that there are some people know more than they do, and, and there are people they can, and, and of course, that's always true anyway, I, I mean, there were public figures that people rely on, right. uh, maybe it's just Taylor Swift or somebody, but, you know, there's yeah. always going to be somebody that people look to and form their opinions on, and uh, he thought that that tendency could be, uh, you, know, you know, could be effective even in a democracy, mm -hmm. if you... Uh, had the right people who were rightly educated and lived ad admirable lives. Right. So that everybody would say, oh, yeah, this guy, uh, we got to listen to what he has to say. How would you compare his instincts, his political instincts, to someone like Edmund Burke? He admired Burke a lot. Um, the instincts are very similar. Uh, Burke uh, put a lot more role, uh, a lot more emphasis on tradition as such, mm -hmm. which... Uh, more as an American was not in a position to do. Uh, you know, he thought that uh, Burke was moderate, uh, had a broad vision of things. Uh, you know, understood when he had to do something when you're and when you're better off leaving things alone. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, yeah, he admired Burke. Uh, yeah. he, he just lived in a very different sort of country. Mm -hmm. And he he saw tradition as something um, that was important in sustaining. Uh, you know, cultural continuity and stability over time. Um, but he he recognized that America was unique and it ne didn't necessarily have those roots in a connected institutional way. Yeah, it wasn't like Europe at all. Right. Uh, you know, he, uh, he liked England. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, at one point late in his life, he said, he said, gee, maybe after I quit being a critic, I should have moved to England. T.S. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Eliot. But so, uh, but... Uh, you know, it's just a different country, and so you have to deal with things differently. I mean, that's what being uh, prudent is all about. You uh, look, you understand what your circumstances are, and you relate those somehow or other mm -hmm. uh, to like permanently important considerations, and you do your best, the best you can. Yeah. Is there any obvious differences between he and Babbitt that are worth talking about? You know, politically, they're very similar. Um, you know, they're intellectually very different. Uh, Moore was much more religious. Uh, one, one problem Babbitt had was that his father was a religious crank mm -hmm. uh, who apparently <laughs> is still remembered by people who are into, I don't know, magnetism uh -huh. or something <laughs> like that. Um, and so <laughs> that, that sort of put uh, Babbitt off religion permanently. Okay. I and, think, but Babbitt did influence more toward Christianity, though, too, right? Uh, so certainly uh, away from uh, Hinduism and, and towards something that's more uh, identifiably uh, Western and based on uh, the classic tradition, which more ended up thinking Christianity really very much was. Mm hmm. He thought that, uh, as mentioned, uh, Chalcedon was a culmination of Plato. Right. That it took a wrong turn with Plotinus, and Aristotle had the wrong idea. But uh, right. Chalcedon was really the way you uh, you make the best use of what Plato can tell us. 
what um what role did did more see christianity playing i mean you talked about how uh, we all need something to guide our lives and to give us meaning and fulfillment um, and to sort of order us not only individually, but also as, as communities towards something higher. Uh, is that the basic function of Christianity in his mind? Well, there's a need for guidance, but there's also the idea that it's uh, good to lay on to what's real. Mm -hmm. he, you know, he was seriously religious he had hit a deep skeptical streak. And uh, you know, just because of his cast of mind, I think I mentioned that, that you know, his commitment, he has a very hard time making his commitment uh, you know, quite a, to Christianity uh, quite as uh, complete as uh, maybe would have been good. Mm -hmm. But uh, you, know, you have to uh, bring your life into order. And the way you bring your life into order is by looking at what's really real and trying to form yourself on that. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't at all a utilitarian approach. He thought okay. that, that, that uh, well, yeah, I mean, obviously, if you don't have religion, you're going to have big problems, but that wasn't the basic idea. Okay. Uh, was he institutionally committed to any, um, was like the Catholic Church or any Protestant tradition? Uh, yeah, sort of high church Anglicanism uh, and uh except that he never really was confused. He started off Presbyterian mm -hmm. at home. And then when he was a teenager, uh, he decided he didn't believe in any of that, or okay. at least in enough of it or, or something. <clears throat> and uh, then he was attracted to uh, the Anglican tradition, I guess because in the first place, it's not quite so absolute as the Catholic Church is. But they did carry forward uh, the sacraments, which were important for him, right. and also the uh, basic creeds and doctrines, which were also extremely important to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, like on his deathbed, uh, like he would attend Anglican or Episcopalian, I guess, in this country uh, services. But uh, I don't think he ever received communion until he was on his deathbed, and I don't think it was actually confirmed. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, you know, he had a, uh, yeah, he was sort of committed to Anglicanism, but uh, that, that tradition, but not completely, which maybe fits the tradition. Yeah. And it's hard. It was probably harder to do that, you know, in uh, early 20th century America um, to be, you know, committed in that way to institutional Anglicanism, um, especially with his background in St. Louis. Is that where he was born? St. Louis? I think. Yeah. St. Louis. Yeah. yeah. Right. Everybody came from St. Louis. Yeah. Yes. Elliot, Paul Evermore. <laughs> right. Um, so, so more, he did see Christianity as something that um, would sustain the West and it was needed because you needed something deeper and more specific than Plato's religious myths. You know, Plato talked about the importance of religious myths and binding community, but more pointed out that you needed, you needed something more specific uh, to, for that thing to be la uh, lasting. Well, yeah, he, he became aware of the problem, which is also a problem with uh, uh, somebody like uh, uh, Richard Weaver. Mm -hmm. That, yeah, you can talk about the moral imagination and all that, and it's all very nice, but who does that work for? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's like the um, uh, comment, uh, if it's just a symbol to hell with it. You know, <laughs> uh, so that... Uh, you know, he, he became more aware of that as time went time went on. So for him, he, for real. him, for for a for a religion that would be lasting, it would need uh, the component of divine revelation that Christianity brings. Yeah, yeah, he, uh, yeah, no, he he thought divine revelation was necessary. That, uh, and also it just made sense. I, I mean, well, you have to somehow rescue God from being just a concept. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's the uh, the most real, be if he's the most real being, then uh, yeah, yeah, that just can't be just a theory, and it has yeah. to manifest himself. And he was a little bit cherry about committing himself fully to that. For example, uh, you know, he thought that the resurrection was real, but not exactly physical. Mm -hmm. he, he, you know, he thought the uh, he's, you know, he liked to point at. Uh, Paul's experience on the road to Damascus that, well, yeah, there's something real going on here, but it wasn't like a, a flesh and blood 
man showing up and saying, hi, I'm Jesus. So why are you doing this stuff? Uh, so uh, there was just a certain reluctance. He, he just had a very critical uh, way of looking at things, which of course is great, great on a critic. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, it's not going to make him a uh, morally religious leader, except for a few intellectuals. Right, right. You draw a number of parallels between his tendency and thought and Pascal's. Maybe, maybe comment on that a little bit. Sure. Um, well, your basic both of them basically start off with this skeptical, analytical, modern view and what that does to the world. Mm -hmm. But then you take that skeptical analytical view and you apply it more broadly and say what is my situation what do i know um how do i come to know anything uh, i can't avoid thinking i know some things because i have to live mm -hmm. and uh, in order to live at all i have to act as if some things are true and i'm not only going to act that way i'm actually going to believe it mm -hmm. so how do you decide what things are true and uh, there you get into this process of saying, well, how can I best make sense of life as I find it? You know, it's just as uh, a bunch of different views, some of them sort of scant, you know, leave out aspects of experience. Uh, you can point to uh, materialism. Uh, how does that explain how we uh, have consciousness? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you can, uh, uh, so, so that, uh, it's this process of uh, you're asking yourself, how do I explain all this? How do I make sense of all this? Because I have to make some sort of sense of it because of the sheer necessity of doing something rather than something else. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, both of them ended up with uh, Christianity as the uh, uh, result of all that. Uh, Pascal in a more thoroughgoing way right? than more. You know, a different sort of mind altogether. Right. Why do you think? Um, why do you think there's no books? I mean, you can find them online and stuff, but why? Why? Why is he neglected today? I don't know. Um, you know, he's he's very idiosyncratic. Right. Like some people contrast him to somebody like uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, who is also very literary and scholarly, and uh, ended up in Christianity because that's. You know, how you uh, can make sense of life, life, the world as you find it. Uh, but uh, in the first place, E. You know, Lewis was more thoroughgoing in what he was willing to do intellectually. He mm -hmm. was able to commit more fully. And uh, you know, more, you know, he's a good critic. I, I mean, you read his criticism, his literary criticism, and it's very good. Uh, you know, sort of analyzing, well, here's this writer and where does he stand in uh, relation to other writers and what does he do really well and uh, and so on. But, uh, you know, that maintains this uh, sort of analytical weighing and judging mm -hmm. approach, which does come to conclusions, but uh, that, that's not in the long run what people are looking for in a religious thinker. You know, who, yeah. you know, they want to help them with that really basic commitment that tells them what the world's like and what they should do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's criticism. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's not one of the absolutely top critics, like, I don't know, T.S. Eliot or somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, he's very good, uh, but uh, not someone who uh, affected the outlook on literature enough to, to make people right. go back and reread them. And as a religious thinker, uh, he's a bit too tentative and idiosyncratic. Right. So I like your quote uh, in here in the essay when he says of himself that he's at once the least read and most hated author in existence. Um, so he recognized, you know, his he didn't have much of an influence. Uh, did he sound... Um, regretful about that at all when he was writing this or was this um sad was sort of sort of wry humor uh yeah i don't know like like i said toward the end of his life he said gee maybe i should have gone off and lived in england <laughs> right uh you know i 
and, and generally, the, he he was happy with his life. Uh, yeah. He had good friends. Uh, he married well. Uh, mm -hmm. He had uh, good relations with his family. Um, you know, he uh, lived a materially comfortable life. Uh, there's certainly plenty of things that fascinated him uh, about life, letters, the world. Uh, so that, uh, you know, it's, it's very much the opposite of a, a failure, except to the extent that everybody fails and, right. uh, and in sort of an ultimate way. Does he come across as optimistic or pessimistic uh, for the future, you know, from, where, from his own standpoint in the early 20th century? He doesn't show his hand much on that. Mm -hmm. he, he seems to say, well, here's how we can do better than we're doing. Yeah. He, he, he doesn't say, oh, the university system and public life is all going to hell and there's no way it's ever going to get better. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, he's more interested in, well, what, can you, what could you do about this? Mm -hmm. um, did, he, did he spend a lot of time elaborating on, you know, deep, systemic or cultural problems in America that could be, you know, really bad for civilization. I want to describe him that way. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The idea that uh, people pay too much attention to practicality and toward uh, sentiment rather than judgment uh, were, were basic issues for him. Mm -hmm. You know, he thought that there was a way out. Uh, he didn't have any, uh, uh, theory of history okay. Uh, that told him, oh, no, this isn't going to work. Uh, it's just going to get worse forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wasn't, yeah, that wasn't his view. Uh, right. Yeah, again, maybe to that extent, his uh, sort of analytical approach mm -hmm. uh, you know, helped him because it, uh, it, it meant that he couldn't get uh, too down in the dumps because of some grand theory because there are going to be problems with that grand theory as well. Yeah. What would he have said about um, the rise of uh, digital media and you know corresponding electronically and all of that? Would that would that would those things have bolstered his confidence in the academy or or undermined it? Probably undermined it because uh, you know, it causes everything to lose definition. Mm -hmm. You know, like discussions never seem to stay on point because uh, you know, the connection, the human connection, is just not very solid. <clears throat> anybody can always be replaced instantly by somebody else who lives in a different part of the world because the, the, it's just so easy to connect and disconnect. Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, the ability to manipulate electronic presentations. Yeah. You, know, you can make anything look like anything. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I doubt that he would have uh, seen grounds for optimism in that. Right. There's one quote that you have here in your essay. It says, our people generally are more interested in safety and comfort and our elites in wealth and power than in platonic myths, the inner check, the moral imagination. So it's it strikes me in reading that sentence that, um, you know, we're not we're not set up as we are right now uh, to revive civilization, but we're going to keep um, in, in a state of degradation sort of, if we don't, um, you know, reawaken our own ability to connect with the past and the platonic yeah. myths and religion. Yeah. yeah well, the, uh, you yeah, know, right now it seems that the uh, important thing is to keep as much going as we can to connect uh, with each other and uh, to, uh, yeah, so sort of counter networks. I'm mean, the sort of thing that Chronicles, for example, is trying to do. Mm -hmm. You know, a place where you can have discussions about what's going on and uh, and certain sorts of ideas uh, about what to do about it uh, can be developed. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's uh, it seems at present uh, civilization is more a matter of small groups, right, uh, than of grand trends. I, I mean, you. Uh, you can't leave out grand trends altogether. You, every now and then you see something optimistic about, well, maybe really, we really can do something about architecture yeah, to make it less horrible because <laughs> everybody knows it's horrible. So you ought to be able to get some public support. Yeah. Uh, for I think a lot of people who've looked up, you know, more, they don't know where to start with him because his books are hard to find. Um, they can find digital copies of them. But if you, if you had to start somewhere, would you start with maybe you would start with Babbitt or something just to familiarize yourself with humanism? But where would you start in investigating this world? Well, Babbitt has more of a coherent view. 
Mm -hmm. a more of a uniform coherent view so from that standpoint uh he might be a better person to start with mm -hmm. um otherwise i guess it depends more on interests uh you know if you're interested in literature you can read some of his criticism see what he says about authors that you like those would be in the shelbourne essays is that right yeah shelbourne new shelbourne essays right and those came out in the over the course of what the 20s and 30s or yeah uh you know the you know, the teens and 20s. Uh, okay. I think going to the 30s, it was the new Shelbourne essays. Okay. Is there like a, is there a content or flavor difference between those? Uh, well, it's thought, oh, well, no, I mean, the fact that it's new Shelbourne essays just means that it's a, a different series uh, okay. from a publication standpoint. Right, right. It's not like he starts on page one and says, I, I hereby reject all that junk I said. <laughs> <laughs> right. Back on the Shelbourne essays. Uh, yeah, so it's... Uh, uh, yeah, you can, uh, no, it, it, to me, it's, it's fairly similar, uh, similar mm -hmm. content as thought does develop. Uh, but, uh, so if you have, lit if you're interested in literature, you could read, uh, some of this, uh, criticism, um, you know, if you, uh, interested in, uh, various aspects of religion, you could look at like the, uh, uh, the skeptical approach to religion, which goes into, uh, Right. His uh, sort of Pascal like. Would you uh, consider him difficult mm -hmm. to read? Uh, his criticism is not difficult. Uh, I, I wouldn't say he's difficult. Uh, you know, you have to be somewhat aware of, of the stuff he's writing about. Mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's not an introductory writer. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to know something about what he's writing about. I mean, if. Uh, you want to read what he says about Samuel Johnson? It'll, it'll be helpful to have read Samuel Johnson before, right? Uh, to already have somewhat of an interest in in, in that writer. You mentioned uh, that people like Kirk tried to revive him. Um, yeah, but he didn't really catch on even after Kirk talked about him. Yeah, yeah, Kirk, Kirk uh, pumped him up. You know, the greatest uh, <laughs> Christian apologist uh, uh, of the 20th century. Um, which was that in the conservative mind, or was that elsewhere? I think it was conservative mind. Yeah, I, I think that's where it's. Was uh, he was he one of the figures? I I, I believe that, as okay. I recall, it's been a while since I've looked at Kirk. Yeah, but my recollection is that, uh, you know, he was one of the figures that uh, Kirk focused on early on. Mm. Not not that he abandoned him later, but uh, right. You know, you know, if he wanted to uh, stitch together a uh, conservative tradition in America that nobody had noticed before. Uh, <laughs> You know, Moore would be one of the guys you had put into it. Yeah. With his critique of like technocracy and the coming managerialism in the early 20th century, do you think he would have been surprised at the difficulties we're facing today? Uh, no. Uh, you know, the uh, idea that things can be managed uh, when they really can't. Mm -hmm. And that uh, if you want to know what to do in Afghanistan, you just ask the social scientists. Right, right. Uh, you know, that's ridiculous. The uh, would, would that be the would that be the basic thrust of humanism is just understanding the limits and constraints of man? Certainly, that's an important thrust, and uh, you know, you, there's that aspect. You, you really can't manage human life. You can you can do you can do better. Uh, mm -hmm. It's possible to see it as more of a whole. And to uh, you know, pick out the things that are likely to uh, to continue and to be dominant, mm -hmm. and, and not uh, be too much impressed by uh, 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 particular new theories that come along. Yeah, you, you know, the new humanism wanted to develop steady judgment is kind of uh, something people could have in public life. Yeah, you know, the ability to think clearly, to express themselves clearly, to think. Uh, about things uh, steadily and with uh, a lot of perspective mm -hmm. so they wouldn't get carried away by some fantasy that they're going to be able to do this or that something's going to be more catastrophic than it really was although they did recognize catastrophes uh, mm -hmm. you know for example in the 20s uh irving babbitt uh, was predicting how there's going to be this huge war of uh, uh, racial extermination in the pacific and uh, that he reads about this atomic uh, energy stuff, and that's going to be turned into bombs, and so <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> yeah, so that apparently uh, 
studying the classics uh, did help you see uh, the direction things would likely go. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, 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 you it, know it, a lot of it's just moderation. Right. Good sense of moderation. It really seems like they, uh, you know, a key component of their contributions was to call out the hubris of man. Um, you know, the, it's, there's just this this uh, tendency, especially in America in the 20th century, that we can make the world a better place and we can use our expertise, our science um, to to basically help overcome the past and to bring us forth into a, a better world. And I think the humanists, especially with more, would have called um, balderdash on that whole enterprise. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 You know, that uh, yeah, times do change, but there's a limit to how much they change because there's a lot of basic things that are still the way they were uh, 2,000 years ago. Yeah. So if I were to ask you what your favorite piece of literary criticism from Moore would be, does anything come to mind? Gee, that's a good question because, uh, yeah, he's so varied. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, uh, I think the demon of the absolute is... Uh, it's just sort of useful for understanding something about his outlook on things. What's is that an essay on? It's it, it's what's well, an essay on? Uh, you know, people tendency to make categorical uh, judgments mm -hmm. uh, that has this high philosophical implications, like you saw in Aristotle, who was trying to get too much of a comprehensive theory, uh, but also into uh, yeah everyday judgments where he talks about some literary critics who uh is that a book or is that an essay it's an essay it's yeah, a long essay there, there, there's i think one of the shelbourne uh okay. volume the shelbourne essays it's uh, yeah you know it, it includes that it's, it's rather long um so uh you know that's worth uh that's worth, let, let me let me take a look just a second if uh yeah, you take a look at that, but I I think uh, I recall seeing that one. I, I the title somewhere, and it always struck me: the demon in in the absolute. Yeah, um, the de demon of the absolute. Yeah, yeah, of the yeah, absolute. yeah. Okay, and he does yeah. and he does have some good essays on like Samuel Johnson and and people like oh, that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. On uh, I'm first, uh, you can read read them on natural aristocracy, and uh, mm -hmm. but, but th th those aren't exactly literary essays. You know, they they do touch. Yeah, you know, he believed in life and letters. Yeah, that uh, you know the point of literature is that uh, you know tells us something about life, and uh, you know really ought to relate to our our concerns in living. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I don't know if somebody wanted to explore his criticism, I'd say uh, you know just uh, reconcile yourself to uh, reading something on a tablet. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. All right, my last question is this. Um, he was part of the Remembering the Right series. So what makes him, what, what about him uh, would make you consider him a person on the right? Well, he thought there were limits uh, in life that uh, progressivism doesn't really progress all that much because he keeps sliding back and that uh, you needed to be aware of uh, permanent considerations. Uh, you, you need to uh, be aware of, uh, you know, the Western tradition of, of what has been achieved and uh, the importance of uh, constantly going back to that or, or maintaining an awareness of that. Mm -hmm. And also he emphasized things like uh, discipline, judgment, uh, your private property, uh, at least on a small scale. Uh, so that, uh, yeah, it's definitely anti-progressive mm -hmm. and uh, pro-stability. And so from that standpoint, uh, you, you'd put them on the right. Well, good. Well, I would encourage people to subscribe to Chronicles Magazine so that you can get these remem Remembering the Right essays um, as part of it. And I think, when was yours? Yours was a couple months ago, right? I yeah, yeah, it's in December. December, okay, yeah. So uh, Remembering Paul Elmer Moore. Um, I appreciate your time and yeah, everyone should read, uh, you know, pick up a subscription and read the essay because he's a fascinating person to get into, um, you know, just from understanding, you know, our own, you know, Greek here, there's a, there's an aspect of, of the West that is, em that emphasizes, you know, our Greek philosophical heritage and more spent a lot of years pulling that out. So I think it's important uh, that people familiarize uh, yourselves with, with him. So thank you for your time today and we'll have you come, uh, 
on again because I think you have another. Didn't you have another? Uh, yeah, one on? yeah, yeah. So it wasn't quite double barreled, but there, because there was a month between them. But uh, who I was it? Oh, it was Don Noche, Noche, right? Noche, Augusto Don Noche. Yeah, so we'll have you on to discuss him soon. But uh, thank you for your time today. Okay, good to be with you.